Greetings everyone, it is me, Noodle Arm Boy, here with another video. In this one, I will tell you all about Linux and why you might want to consider switching to Linux. Now, you might be thinking that it is some very complicated operating system only made for programmers and other insane people, but in this video, I will show you that that is not the case. In fact, in front of you, you can see me running Linux. I'm recording this video on Linux. I'm able to make my thumbnails, edit my videos, do everything that I do on Linux. And no, it's not as scary as you might think. So let me show you my little presentation that I've prepared. I'm using Emacs here, by the way. That is my text editor of choice. And it can also do presentations, sort of. So let's get started. What is Linux? Linux is a free and open source or FOSS operating system. Now let's delve into that statement and deconstruct it a little bit to make it a bit clearer. So what is an operating system? Some people aren't even familiar with this term. So I figured I might as well start with the basics. An operating system or an OS is system software that manages computer hardware, software resources, and provides common services for computer programs. This is just a definition from Wikipedia. Now, let's actually go into the most common desktop operating systems that exist out there. So, obviously, there's Windows, which is the most widespread desktop operating system by far. It is made by Microsoft and it has 75.5% of the market. This is most likely the operating system that you're running, but if not, the second most likely guess would be macOS, which is made by Apple and has almost 16% of the market. The next most commonly used operating system is Chrome OS which actually comes pre-installed on Chromebooks and is made by Google and takes 2.6% of the market. So not very high, but they do have quite a lot of budget laptops that they sell with Chrome OS. Now, it should be noted here that it is based on Linux. Uh, so that is going to be the next operating system we talk about, Linux, which was originally made by Linus Torvalds and is still maintained by him. and of course, it's an open source project. There have been many, many contributors over the years. Even uh, the aforementioned companies have been involved in uh, the code of Linux in some way. And of course, Google in quite a major way, uh, so much so that they even have their own operating system. And you might have also heard of SteamOS, which is made by Valve, which is also based on Linux. Their upcoming Steam Deck is going to run Linux. In the world of desktop computers, it only takes 2.2% of the market share. But if you look at the technicalities, when we're just looking at any computer, the majority of computers around the world actually run Linux. This is because Linux is most often used for servers and also because Android phones actually use the Linux kernel. Now I'll touch on that a little bit later. And the last operating system that I thought I might as well shout out is BSD, which is the Berkeley Software Distribution, which was originally made by the University of California, Berkeley, and only takes up 0.01% of the market share. This original OS is not maintained anymore. So when people talk about BSD uh, in the modern world, they're usually referring to its descendants like FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, and others. Just like Linux, there are many different varieties of it. Now this one, from what I can tell at least, is mostly just used by developers um, and is not the most well-suited desktop operating system for daily usage. But in any case, let's move on with our breakdown of what Linux is. Free, very simple, just means free of charge. There are some varieties of Linux which you have to pay for, but there's really no reason that you have to go for these. For the most part, Linux is free. And lastly, it's open source, which means that the code is available publicly for anyone to see or use or make their varieties of. And in fact, this is what leads to Linux 
having many different varieties. Now, there is an important clarification to be made, which is that Linux is typically thought of as an OS, but it's actually just an OS kernel, which is the part that sits between your computer hardware, so your CPU, your memory, and other computer devices, and the actual applications that run on your computer. Now, when you really think about it, this makes a lot of sense. It wouldn't be very efficient if every program, uh, a browser, a game, a text editor, everything had to talk to the hardware directly and it could mess things up and would be a lot of overlapping code. So it would be a very inefficient system. So you have your OS kernel, which talks to the hardware and acts as this intermediary and also keeps things more secure. Uh, and this chart, by the way, is also from Wikipedia. The whole operating system is actually Linux together with GNU and other software. GNU is a collection of software that has been made by the Free Software Foundation and is also free and open source. And it completes the Linux operating system. Now, it says GNU usually because there are also other uh, collections of tools that pretty much replace what GNU tools do. But the majority of the time, you will see that Linux comes with GNU installed. And a lot of the time, you will also have other software pre-installed. But this is not necessary. So yes, Linux is not just an operating system by itself. Linux is a kernel. And as I mentioned before, uh, Android, also uses the Linux kernel, but it is an operating system of its own and it comes with other software. All of this, Linux, GNU, and potentially other software, gets packaged into what's called a distribution. And this is actually what you install on your computer and use in your day-to-day -day life. Now, there are many different Linux distributions. There is no way I would be able to talk about all of them and I am not even remotely familiar with all of them. But some of the most popular ones include Ubuntu, and this is probably the only one that the average person would have heard of. I myself knew about Ubuntu before I switched to Linux. So yes, this is still the most popular Linux distribution, and it is especially widespread for use in servers, uh, but that is not what this video is about. Another popular distribution, which I highly recommend, is Linux Mint. This one is quite similar to Windows in how it looks and is very simple, very beginner friendly, and honestly is the best distro in my opinion for anyone getting into Linux, especially if they're coming from Windows. Another popular distro is Debian. This is kind of the father of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a derivative of Debian and there are many, many other distributions that are derived in some way from Debian. Another popular distribution is Manjaro, which is actually not based on Debian. It is based on Arch Linux, which is what I'm using here on my computer. So it is a little bit different from the other three that I mentioned. Pop OS is another popular distribution. In fact, you might have heard of it if you watched the Linux gaming challenge by Linus Tech Tips, but he did not have the best experience with Pop OS. Regardless, many people really like Pop! OS. It is also a beginner-friendly distribution, and it actually comes pre-installed on some laptops. There is a company, System76, which maintains Pop! OS and also makes laptops, and they offer Pop! OS as an operating system option for their laptops. And last but not least in my limited list of popular distros is Fedora which is maintained by Red Hat, which is a subsidiary of IBM. Now, let's look at the pros of Linux. One big pro is freedom, by which I mean freedom of cost. It is free, like I mentioned twice already. Uh, excuse me for repeating myself. It is also freedom of your information, privacy. You do not have all of the data collection that Microsoft does on Linux. There are some distributions that optionally ask you to give some telemetry for them to know what kind of people use their operating systems, how to improve them, and so on and so forth. Kind of minimal information, 
but you can very easily opt out of it. And in fact, when you install most of these distributions, they will ask you if it is okay to collect telemetry. And if not, you can just uncheck the box. And another point is the freedom of options. Like I already said, very customizable. You can make it look and behave exactly how you want and really make it force your needs. Another pro is the fact that it's faster. Like I mentioned, Linux is more lightweight, which means that you get faster boot times on average. You also have fewer processes running in the background, which can really eat up your RAM and your CPU. And I wouldn't really say that this is a deal breaker for Windows, but I do think it is a good advantage of Linux over Windows. Another point is that people often say, and for good reason, that Linux can bring old hardware back to life. So if you have some old laptop sitting somewhere gathering dust because you just thought it was too slow and could not use it anymore, you could bring it back to life by installing Linux on it. And especially if you install a more lightweight distribution. I myself have seen this on two different computers at least, and it definitely worked and definitely made them a bit snappier and kind of gave them another life. Another positive that I personally really like is that software on Linux is a lot easier to install. You know how when you want to download a new program on Windows, you have to go online, find the website, find the download file, download it, start it, start the uh, installer and go through the entire install process. And it can be a little bit shady sometimes because you don't really know if you found the right one. But on Linux, most of the time, like 99% of the time you're installing software, you would just use your standard, what's called a package manager. And different distributions can have different ones. Debian uses APT, Arch uses Pac-Man, Fedora has their own, Gen2 I believe has its own. And yeah, this package manager is what you would use to install the software. And it would be the same if you switch to a new computer and you wanted to reinstall all the software you had, you can just enter a command that would install it all for you. And you don't have to enter a command. There are graphical programs that do all that stuff behind the scenes and you just choose whatever program you want and you install it. Now this makes it not only faster, but also more secure because you know you're getting it from the same people who made your operating system. And of course, if you're trusting the person who made your operating system, because if you don't trust them, they could be doing anything on your computer. So if you're trusting them with that, you should definitely be trusting them with the programs you install. And yeah, this kind of ties into my next point, which is security. There is simply way less malware that you get on Linux compared to Windows. And this point is also true for Mac. Uh, Mac users are also not quite as vulnerable to malware because most of the time somebody wants to exploit a vulnerability that they find, they would target Windows because most people use Windows. So they would simply have more victims. And this doesn't mean that malware on Mac OS and Linux doesn't exist, but it's just a lot less widespread. And again, since you always install software through your package manager, it is very, very unlikely that you could ever get a virus on your computer. And when it comes to security, there's also the fact that it's open source, which means that the code has been reviewed by many different security researchers. And trust me, many companies are very much interested in the security of Linux because of how widespread it is especially on servers. Now, my final advantage that I wanted to mention is the fact that Linux is better for developers. So if you make software, websites, things like that, you would probably prefer Linux for a variety of reasons, which I won't really delve into here because this video is more so aimed for the average person. I do, of course, have to mention the cons or the disadvantages of using Linux, one of which is software compatibility. Yeah, unfortunately, we live in a world where most people use Windows, which also means that most software developers just decide to make software for Windows and don't really bother with making it available for Linux. This is also a problem with Mac OS, but I believe it is not quite as bad as with Linux. Now, from what I've heard, this mostly affects video games and creative software, such as uh, software from Adobe, video editors, digital audio workstations, and things like that that are used by people in the creative industry. When it comes to creative software, 
most of it does have decent alternatives. I used to use Photoshop for making my thumbnails and other uh, image edits. And now I switch to GIMP, which is also made by GNU, which I mentioned before. And honestly, it's been great. There are a couple things that I preferred uh, with Photoshop, but frankly, I am very happy to use GIMP. And these days I much prefer using open source software, mainly because of the privacy implications of using proprietary software. As for video games, honestly, I have not found this to be a huge issue. Thanks to Valve, which are super pro-consumer, if you ask me, at least from the point of view of the availability of games on Linux, we have so many games that are compatible with Linux that this is kind of becoming less and less of a valid argument. And to me, it has kind of become the same thing as console exclusives. If I hear of a game that I want to play and I look it up and Steam doesn't show availability for Linux, then I just think, oh, well, I just won't play it. And this is the same way I felt with PlayStation exclusive, for example. These days I play a lot of Minecraft and Civilization and a few other games. And honestly, it's great. I haven't really had any issues. If you are somebody who is interested in competitive games, however, I would recommend staying away from Linux because when it comes to anti-cheat software, Linux support isn't very good, mostly because that software is often quite invasive and really gets a lot of information about what is running on your computer. Another point is worse hardware compatibility. So this concerns printers and scanners, uh, first and foremost. I have not had huge issues with this quite yet. And when I'm gonna actually buy my own printer, I will make sure that it has Linux support. But I just recently installed Linux on somebody else's computer and they had a printer that they wanted to make sure would work and it totally did. And even the scanner part worked. So yeah, you just have to make sure that whatever printer or scanner you're using is compatible with Linux before you commit. There's also a variety of more niche devices that do not have Linux support. Once again, simply because it's not nearly as widespread as Windows. And I would also imagine that perhaps Mac OS has the same kind of problem, maybe just not to the same extent. Now, I don't really use niche devices like these, so I have not encountered any issues like that. Another point is that battery life may be lower if you are using a laptop. However, there are programs that you can install, namely TLP, you can install that, and it can just manage your hardware usage based on whether or not you're running off of battery. Once again, this is a valid point, but I personally have not had big issues with this. Now, my last downside that I will mention is fragmentation, by which I mean that there isn't really the Linux operating system. Instead, there is a variety of Linux distributions which uh, differ based on their package manager, their desktop environment, their software and other things. But from some point of view, you could see this as a positive because this means that Linux is more customizable and you can really choose the distribution that you like. So I don't think this is a huge issue, but it is also a negative to consider. Most of the time though, if you look for a guide on how to fix some issue online and it uses a different distribution from yours, chances are it probably will work for you as well. There is a number of myths that I would like to touch on when it comes to Linux. So first myth, you can't play video games. As I mentioned before, you totally can and I play video games regularly and I've been loving it. The only real issue is that some games, especially competitive multiplayer games, are not supported, or at least not supported in the official sense. Sometimes you will find workarounds. Myth number two, Linux is not beginner friendly. This was definitely true uh, several years back, uh, long before I ever got into Linux, but these days, honestly, it is very easy. In fact, I recently switched uh, two people I know to Linux who are not programmers, not advanced users, just average computer users, and they've been telling me that they like it. They haven't had any issues really, and because there are distributions that make things quite simple and user-friendly, you can't really say that Linux is not beginner-friendly anymore. Some distributions aren't beginner-friendly, but 
at this point, you can't say that Linux as a whole isn't beginner friendly. Myth number three, you have to know the command line. This is also not true. These days, there are many graphical programs that replicate all of the same functionality you could do in a command line. Granted, using a command line is a bit cleaner. And one advantage that I will certainly mention is the fact that whenever you have an issue on Linux, you can find some online guide pretty quickly that shows you how to solve an issue, assuming that it is something fairly mundane and kind of common that happens to people. And you can just copy step by step the commands they entered, which most of the time would not be any more than maybe five commands. You just copy and paste them and chances are your issue is solved. Meanwhile, when you try to solve an issue with Windows, you have to follow a guide precisely on where to click, which program to open, which menu to go into and so on and so forth. And then if they used a different version of Windows uh, when the guide was made, you can't even follow it anymore. So I believe that is a strength of the command line, but at the end of the day, you don't have to use it at all. In your daily life, you will most certainly not see the command line at all, assuming that you're an average user. Myth number four, there is limited technical support. This is also not true. I have had a number of issues that I encountered with my computer, which I looked up online and most of the time fairly quickly found the solution. In fact, I kind of feel like technical support with Linux is better than with Windows. I've had numerous issues in the past with Windows that I tried solving for ages and just never came around to finding a fix for. But because most things are quite reproducible on Linux, I feel like it's easier to solve an issue. And most of the time, you don't even have to ask on forums. Somebody else would have encountered the same issue and you can just follow the reply that they received. Myth number five, things break all the time. Also not true. Now this depends on which distribution you use. If you use an Arch-based distribution, chances are you will have things break at least from time to time. But if you use one that's based on Ubuntu, then it would probably be a lot more stable. I honestly wouldn't say that on something like Linux Mint, things break any more often than on Windows. So this is also a myth. Now here, I would like to talk about my personal experience. So I switched to Linux in June of 2021. So I've been using it for over half a year now. For a while, I used Linux Mint, which I've been raving about this entire video. And honestly, I loved it. There is nothing about it that I did not like really. I did later switch to Arch Linux, but this wasn't because Linux Mint was bad, but rather because I kind of wanted to try a Linux distribution that is a lot more minimal and just starts off with barely anything installed to then allow me to configure it exactly how I want it to look. And I started using tiling window managers, which I can show you right here. If I open some programs, they will all tile and I can automatically switch between them and I can resize my window to be whatever size I want. And yeah, it's very customizable and I can just do everything through the keyboard, uh, which makes it more efficient as well. Honestly, I just like it better than having Windows go over the top of each other. I would say through my experience using Linux, I have really learned a lot, uh, not only about Linux itself, but also just about how computers work in general. I feel like because there's all that tinkering around that you can do, I mean, you don't have to, but I myself, I'm a kind of person who really likes to tinker around. I feel like because of this, I really got to understand how computers work much better. And honestly, I've had a great time using Linux ever since I switched and I never looked back. So at this point in the video, you might be thinking that you're sold, hopefully. And you might be thinking, how do you switch? Because a lot of people find it to be quite a daunting thing to reinstall their operating system. But honestly, it is not difficult, not even remotely. So what's the process? First, you would want to choose your Linux distribution that you prefer. I recommend choosing based on your favorite desktop environment. And a desktop environment is just the environment that you use on your desktop where you have all of your icons and you have a panel and you have something like a start menu. So yeah, that is your desktop environment. And there are many different ones that you can choose from. But if you're coming from Windows, you would probably want to choose something that looks like Windows. So you probably saw this coming. 
I would personally recommend Linux Mint. I think it is very simple, very beginner friendly, and I think it also just looks really nice. And it's relatively customizable by itself. You can change the colors and various behaviors. And yeah, I can't think of a better distro to recommend to a beginner. The next thing you'll want to do is to back up your current drive that has your operating system. If you're on Windows, this will most likely be your C drive. You would want to move all of your files, or at least all of the files that you don't want to lose, onto an external disk because the installation process will wipe your hard drive. There are some Linux installers that don't require you to do that and even allow you to install Linux alongside Windows, which is what I first did when I switched to Linux Mint. There was an option in the Linux Mint installer to just install it alongside Windows. I did that at first just in case I decided that it wasn't for me, but eventually I decided, yes, this is what I want. And I wiped my drive and reinstalled it again and just went for it. Now, once that's done, you have to download what's called an ISO file, which is something that you would burn to a USB stick or whatever other memory device that you would like. And then that device is what you would use to install it. I recommend installing Belena Etcher, which is a program that has a very simple interface that lets you burn an ISO file to a USB device. And I'm pretty sure Belena Etcher is available for any operating system out there. Oh, and by the way, all of this stuff that I'm talking about, I will leave links to it in the description. And lastly, once you have your USB device with Linux on it, you want to plug that into your computer, restart, get into your BIOS menu, which honestly is not difficult. Uh, if you look up your manufacturer of your computer online, let's say you have a Lenovo laptop, look up Lenovo BIOS menu, and it'll show you which button you have to press while your computer is starting up in order to enter the BIOS menu. And I can just tell you that this usually is F1 or F2. Uh, for Lenovo or Asus, it should be F2. If you have an HP computer, it would probably be F9. And if not, you can always just look up your computer online and find what button you have to press. If you have a desktop computer, this would have to be the model of your motherboard. And once you're in the BIOS menu, you select your USB device as your boot device. And from there, you will be inside of your Linux image running straight from your USB device. And in fact, you can just use this to test out if you even like it. And after that, when you're ready, just install. I will also leave a link to the documentation for Linux Mint, which explains how to do this entire install process in great detail, and I highly recommend it. This is how I got started myself. And yeah, I think that's about everything for this video. I hope that I convinced at least some of you to try out Linux. There's honestly no reason for you to even have to commit. You can just try to burn it to a USB device and run it directly off it and see if you like the way it's laid out. And you can try different distributions, find the one that you like. But if not, I hope that at least you will learn something new and maybe you can suggest it as an option to some of your friends. Before I go, I would like to thank my Patreon supporters, William and Minecraft Underground. Thank you guys for supporting me and for anyone else who decides to become a patron. I should probably mention here that because of the current sanctions against Russia, I won't be able to withdraw my funds for a while. But this isn't a huge issue because I wasn't really withdrawing them regularly anyways, as my Patreon is still quite small. I still thought it would be worth mentioning here. It looks like the funds will just keep accumulating in the account for me to withdraw later. I am kind of considering adding crypto donations, but I'm not sure what you guys will think about that. Please let me know in the comments. And yeah, this whole situation with the war in Ukraine is just awful. I really hope that it can end soon. And I'm honestly kind of glad that I'm not in Russia or especially not in Ukraine right now. Sorry to leave on a bit of a sad note, but in any case, I hope that you learned something new from this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later.